Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us uh, to talk a little bit more about how we are securing cross-device flows and applying uh, zero trust principles to that. Um, my name is Peter Kassman. I'm an identity standards architect at Microsoft, and this is my colleague, uh, Nick Ludwig. Uh, Nick, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, everybody. I'm Nick. Uh, yeah, mic's on. Cool. Uh, I am a product manager at Microsoft, um, and I focus specifically on uh, essentially authentication and authorization protocols, which most uh, generally ends up being OAuth and OIDC. Uh, and this is my first time at Identiverse, first time speaking here, so Thanks all for coming, and a big thank you to the organizers as well. Uh, this has been a fantastic experience, uh, and I'm excited to come back in future years, too. Thanks, Nick. Um, so the next 25 minutes, we're going to do a quick recap about what a cross-device flow is, what they are, why they matter. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit more about what some of the problems with these cross-device flows are, how they're being exploited. So we'll sort of detail some of the attacks that we've seen. Um, and then we'll talk about some zero trust principles uh, and some really practical mitigations that we can deploy against them um, and, uh, and also talk a little bit maybe about alternative protocol choices when we start thinking about cross-device flows. So I think first off, um, Nick, I'm going to let you talk a little bit more about cross-device flows. Cool. So what is a cross-device flow? Well, as the name suggests, it is a flow involving two devices, the first of which is going to be the initiating device, which is going to send a request to the authorization server. And in response, that authorization server is going to send a code back to that initiating device. Uh, and then that code will be displayed uh, on the device's screen. Next up, the user involved in this flow is going to go ahead and take out their what's most likely going to be their mobile device. Uh, and either scan the QR code or take that uh, sort of numeric code off the screen uh, and enter it into their phone. Next up, they're going to finish the sign-in process, right? enter their credentials uh, into this authorization device, uh, and then if all succeeds, tokens will be sent back to the initiating device uh, that can then use the tokens however they would like to. Next one. So in a nutshell, uh, you initiate the session on one device, you authorize on another device, and then tokens are then, then sent back to that initiating device once successful sign-in has occurred. Uh, and there's a couple benefits for this as well, too. So first and foremost, it allows for authorization to occur uh, on devices that have limited input capabilities. Um, like you can't connect a keyboard to them or anything like that. And then additionally, strong authentication. It allows strong authentic authentication to occur with a personally trusted device. So I'm going to hand it back to Peter to chat a little bit about the problems with cross-device flows. Thank you, Nick. So that's all pretty straightforward, right? So what could possibly go wrong here, right? It's simple. I'm using my mobile phone. I can do MFA and I can... Um, authenticate using a device that I trust. This is, these are good things, right? We, we want to be able to do that. Um, the problem is this gap. There is an air gap between the device, uh, the initiating device, um, and the authorizing device. And uh, this is being exploited by, uh, by attackers. And so, um, and I'll talk more about this unauthenticated channel and the challenges that come with that, right? So, um, this air gap, there's no way to establish trust. And, you know, I know all of you have been sort of busily scanning QR codes all week. Um, have you ever thought about what the origin and the providence of that QR code is? Should you scan that code? Um, and there's really no protocol, right? It's, it's all down to the user. So there's no protocol to establish trust between these devices. And what we're really saying to the user is, hey, use your best judgment. Um, and this is really opening up these flows to abuse by attackers using social engineering to perform these illicit consent grant or cross-device consent phishing attacks, um, as, we, as we call them. So how does that work? Well, <clears throat> so here's the common attack pattern. There's a couple of variations on this. I'm going to take the one that's most common and the one that we see most frequently. Um, but, uh, and I'll talk more about where you can learn more about some of the others as well. So in this scenario, and I think if any of you were at the keynote uh, earlier this week, uh, where uh, Ken Mandro talked about 
um, this idea with the IoT devices, right? The attacker has control of the device. And it turns out with some of these attacks, right, the attacker actually can get control of the device, or at least they can initiate the protocol. And so what the attacker does is they contact the authorization server and they say, hey, get me a code, right? And of course the authorization, authorization server says, yep, sure, here's a code for you. Um, and then they take this code and they change the context um, very cleverly, right? So one attack pattern is, uh, I call it the click to win, right? Here is a QR code and it comes with a message and it says, scan this code uh, and we will extend your Netflix subscription by a month. It's like, yeah, that's great, I want that deal. Or more nefariously, uh, you get an email uh, or you get a message and it says, um, you know, we're about to delete your uh, SharePoint site. Uh, please scan this code and log in to um, prevent us from deleting your SharePoint site and losing all your documents. And so that is, it's kind of compelling, right? You get that message uh, early in the morning and you're in a rush and you want to not have that happen to you. Uh, and so they change this context. There are versions of this. I have a billboard there. Uh, there are versions of this that is you know, in the physical world, a QR code being put on a, a bicycle in these bike hire schemes, uh, et cetera, right? So if you, the, the key thing is if you can get the QR code in a place that is convenient for somebody to scan, scan and, they, and you have uh, some incentives for them to do so, uh, these attacks uh, become possible. So the user uh, acts and they scan, uh, or they enter the code on their authorization device, and they authenticate. They may be using uh, multi-factor authentication here, any number of authentication mechanisms. Um, and the attacker retrieves the tokens, and now they have an access token and a refresh token. The access token allows them to access the user's resources. The refresh token allows them to continue getting new access tokens for as long uh, as that refresh token is valid, which can be a substantial amount of time, right? So now uh, you've got yourself into a token theft situation. So in summary, um, you the attacker initiates the session, they retrieve the code, they then use a social engineering attack to change the context and persuade the user to authorize that decision uh, and they end up bypassing multi-factor authentication, so they don't even need to harvest credentials, but they're harvesting uh, tokens, right? So, so that's sort of the shape of this attack. Um, and so what's happening here? Well, you know, we designed these protocols and we designed these flows and experiences, um, and we think about what I call homo securitas, right? This is our defense as a security expert, somebody who understands the, the um, uh, the protocol, they know how it should work, they're very sensitive to uh, social engineering attacks, they're laser focused on the current context, um, but it's a very rare species and there may not even be any in this room, despite what we think. This is who we're really dealing with, right? This is who we are putting the onus on. Uh, there are expertise elsewhere customers, right? They're busy, they're not security experts, they don't want to learn about how we think they should behave, right? They're not gonna do that. Uh, they're busy, they're in a rush, they need to get things done. They also tend to worry about breaking things, right? That message about your SharePoint site being deleted, oh my goodness, I do not want to explain to my manager why I lost all my documents, right? So I, I don't want things to break. And they want to help, right? So that's a, another sort of feature. And so when we think about this, right, we really want to get to a place where people are making fewer decisions they need to make better decisions when they have to, but we also need to accept that they are gonna make bad decisions, and so we need to protect them when the bad decision was made, right? And I think that's sort of a key thing um, as part of this, and as we think about zero trust, is we sort of have to assume that this is gonna go wrong at some point. Um, and so uh, as a response to this, uh, uh, across industry, uh, we've been taking these learnings. These are attacks against uh, our infrastructure and, and against uh, protocols that is broadly in use. Um, so industry-wide, we've really launched three things, right? On the one end, the first thing is really stop the bleeding, right? Some pragmatic mitigations, things that we can deploy without changing the protocols, 
uh, defenses that we can add on the back end in the user experience, et cetera. And we'll, uh, Nick's going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, the other option is to explore some alternatives, right? So I think there are different uh, layers of uh, security when it comes to these cross-device flows. And again, we'll talk more about those. The device authorization grant is the one that I've talked about initially. Um, this is the one that we see most commonly exploited. Um, but there are other options if you need to go cross device that's going to give you better security, up to and including things like using the authorization code grant with WebAuthn and FIDO pass keys. Um, and then the other thing that we have done is we've, uh, we're working with the University of Stuttgart, uh, where there is a team of researchers who specialize in formal methods. And so this group, uh, have been, we've been working very closely with them over the last uh, 12 months or so, and we expect in the next couple of months they will have completed their analysis. And that'll give us a good insight into whether there are A, additional exploits out there, and B, whether the mitigations that we're thinking about is actually effective or what the conditions are under which they are effective, right? So we're putting these protocols onto a more formal footing. Um, uh, and that's a general trend that's now happening in the standards uh, uh, world is, you know, when new protocols get developed, uh, there is this additional thing around making sure that a formal verification proof or a mathematical proof is done to at least understand uh, wh what the uh, security characteristics uh, might be. So I think that is the story around the attack. So now Nick is going to be the hero and tell you what you can do about all these problems. Nick, over to you. Thank you. So protecting against this really starts with uh, taking a look at the zero trust principles. So there are three to mention here uh, that make up the crust of, or crux of zero trust. Uh, the first being to verify explicitly. Next, least privilege and finally, to assume breach. So verify explicitly uh, is to authenticate and authorize uh, for all users based on all available data points at all points in time. Least privilege is to only grant access on sort of a minimum or lowest amount of access needed basis, and then to revoke all unused permissions when no longer necessary. And as for assume breach, it's sort of the practice against uh, sort of limiting the scope of impact in the case of uh, a breach. And you can do this by uh, basically protocol level defense in depth, uh, threat uh, detection, and then also uh, some analytics based stuff as well too. So now is where we take the step sort of from theory here over to uh, what this actually looks like in practice. Uh, but first I wanna mention this quote, uh, so I think that sometimes the security world can be a little complex and ambiguous and it's, yeah, I see somebody laughing, I know, yeah. Uh, anyways, it's, it's often unclear sort of what the first step to take is. Uh, and that's where this quote comes into play, right? You wanna take one step forward and all of a sudden you're moving uh, and making progress towards something that you didn't previously understand or a goal that you previously thought wasn't possible to achieve. And in the context of cross device flows, which are relatively new, uh, it can be a little unclear what the first steps to take are. And so that's what all this is for. Uh, so there are two main pieces here, right? On the left-hand side of the screen is the 15 pragmatic mitigations. And on the right-hand side of the screen is protocol selection. So I'm gonna start off with the pragmatic mitigations. Uh, so if you look at the table, uh, there are all of the pragmatic mitigations listed alongside uh, each of the zero trust principles which those pragmatic mitigations apply to. Additionally, there are some that are highlighted in orange, and these are the ones that we're gonna talk about today specifically. Uh, I wish we had time to cover all of these, but I mean, frankly, it would take way too long. So uh, we're gonna have a QR code, non-malicious QR code, at the end of the presentation that you can scan uh, that'll take you to the BCP, that'll have all of these pragmatic mitigations and as well as protocol selection information in much further detail than we'll be able to cover today. So we'll get to that in a second. But as for the pragmatic mitigations, Let's start off with the ones associated with verify explicitly. So that really begins with establishing proximity. All scenarios essentially where, or, or all attack scenarios are gonna be involving an attacker that is not proximal to the targeted user. 
right? The attacker is going to have some, they're going to be stationed somewhere, whatever, uh, and then they're going to send this code over to the user, probably via email with some uh, basically social engineering to try and get the user to enter that code and then sign in. So not proximal. Uh, so what you're going to want to do is definitely, if you can, establish proximity between two devices. And there are a couple ways to do this. One is going to be through physical connection, right? Uh, wiring the two devices together. The other, uh, and likely, uh, the, the most likely is going to be through uh, sort of wireless connection, right? So there's going to be Bluetooth low energy. Also, NFC is another possible way. Uh, and then the final piece is through geolocation. So using the actual, uh, I guess, geographic locations of the two devices involved to ensure proximity. And as an important caveat, there are going to be scenarios, uh, cross-device scenarios, where the two devices aren't necessarily going to be proximal. Uh, for example, there are some scenarios involving the device authorization grant, uh, which use, I guess, CLIs or uh, containers, which will not uh, be proximal. Uh, but there sort of are a very large set of scenarios which do involve devices that are going to be proximal. So, for example, uh, using a kiosk, right, you're going to be next to the kiosk, interacting with it, and then on your phone you'll, you'll sign in. There's going to be smart TVs as well, uh, and then there's also, for example, conference room devices, just to list a few. And on top of establishing proximity, there's two other pieces here in terms of verify explicitly, uh, which are trusted devices and trusted networks, which are kind of as stated, right? Ensuring that the flow can only be initiated uh, when coming from a trusted device or when coming from a trusted network. Uh, and these are two important mitigations for sort of reducing uh, the scope of scenarios in which you know, the flow can be initiated, right? So moving on uh, is going to be least privilege. Uh, of which the mitigation that we're going to talk about is limited scopes. Uh, so limited scopes is going to be a decision made by the authorization server to essentially limit the scopes which can be uh, issued as part of tokens within the context of any of these cross-device flows. Uh, and this is not going to obviously address the root cause of the attack concern here, but it will limit the impact in the case of a successful attack. So it's definitely important. Uh, but you're going to want to use it in conjunction with some of these other pragmatic mitigations that we have listed here, too. As for assume breach, uh, you'll see the majority of, of these mitigations are, are along the lines of assume breach, but the two that we're going to be talking about are short-lived and time-bound user codes, and then as well as block the flow, which we'll get into in a second. So starting off with short-lived and time-bound user codes, uh, specifically in the context of the device authorization grant, and as well as the example that we showed at the beginning of the presentation, there's going to be a code issued back to that initiating device. And in the context of the attacker scenario, right, they're going to try and get the target to enter that code in and then sign it. And if that code uh, has a really long expiry time, that significantly lengthens the window uh, in which a possible attack could occur. So you definitely want to ensure that the, the, the user code has the shortest expiry time possible. Uh, a good rule of thumb would be somewhere in the range of five to 10 minutes. Um, but you, know, you can test that and figure that out. Additionally, blocking the flow is something important to consider. Uh, it may not necessarily be possible in all contexts. Uh, but for example, you know, cross-device flows don't necessarily need to be used by all organizations. So if you're an organization that doesn't use cross-device flows, it might be worthwhile looking into whether you can block the flow altogether. If you are an organization that uses cross-device flows, uh, you may want to consider blocking the flow only in the contexts in which it's not needed, and obviously leaving the flow unblocked in the context which it is needed, but then in that context, applying these pragmatic mitigations uh, to sort of secure the overall flow. And the second piece here is going to be protocol selection. Uh, so what we have listed here is three protocols to choose from, right? Device authorization grant, client-initiated back-channel authentication, and then authorization code grant with WebAuthn and FIDO. And these are listed in increasing security. So in theory, you would want to choose the flow uh, that is the most secure. So in this case, that would be authorization code grant with WebAuthn and FIDO. Uh, but in practice, that might not necessarily be possible, right? There are uh, different contexts in which the scenarios might be used, uh, different variables specific to your organization that would affect which protocol you would end up using. That being said, whatever protocol you choose, uh, you should choose it in consideration with uh, sort of the pragmatic mitigations and how you would apply those to ensure uh, basically the most secure deployment of whatever cross-device flow you end up using within your organization. 
OK, so moving on. Uh, I know there was a lot of information there, but we didn't end up getting to cover all of the uh, pragmatic mitigations. So this is where the QR code comes into play. Uh, and Peter and some of his colleagues have put together this fantastic BCP, uh, which covers a lot of really good information, um, specifically about the pragmatic mitigations and protocol selection and all of that stuff. Uh, so please take a look at that. Um, I'm sure some of you all have questions. And additionally, we welcome and encourage all collaboration. So there are a few ways for you to get in touch with us. Uh, the first being, come find us after the presentation. We're happy to discuss any of this, uh, more than happy to discuss. Uh, and then also, if you visit the BCP too, uh, I believe there is a way for you to send an email to the authors, or you can open a GitHub issue with any of the feedback that you have, and we'll get to it at a later point. So with that being said, thank you all uh, for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Any closing remarks? No, uh, thanks, Nick. That was excellent. And again, um, please take a look at the best current practice. We are taking that through the IETF at the moment. Um, and if you have any issues or if you have any contributions, or if in your own experience you have some other mitigations that we are not describing, or versions of these attacks that you've encountered that we are not describing in this best current practice document, uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, now is a great time to add this and help educate and inoculate the industry. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yep. I'm very really interested uh, you said that the time you need to code is a mitigation. Yeah, great question. So by limiting the validity period of the user code, you actually force the attacker to do more work, right? So if that, if that user code never expires, I can get it and I have time to scale up an attack because the way these, um, you know, I, I get to do a spray attack, send out a million emails and then I can wait and I can wait for hours until somebody actually acts on it. But if that user code expires every 30 seconds, every five minutes, that means I do a spray attack and then five minutes later I have to do one again, right? So you're raising the cost. Um, you can then also com combine that with um, uh, throttling on the server, right? So that's another mitigation that Nick didn't talk about. Uh, and these, are, these mitigations, they actually, the, it's the classical, right? You do one and another one, you do three or four of them and you get that. And so when you have throttling on the server and you limit the number and the frequency with which you can request new codes and, the limit, uh, and you limit how long they can live, you start disrupting the attacker, right? So they cannot, they may still be able to do the attack, but they can't do it at the scale that would allow them to reap maximum benefits. So that's kind of the, so the idea. Um, yes, if you can, and that's another mitigation that we describe in the BCP, if you can do one time. Um, some systems, when you're operating, operating at a global scale, one time use becomes, how to put it, um, much harder to guarantee, right? So I can have the intent of one time use, but that code, uh, I may receive it, but I need a way to actually communicate to all my global data centers that I've issued this code, right? And that it should only be redeemed once. And it could happen that that code, you know, it gets issued in one place and it gets redeemed in another place. And before I can blacklist it or before the blacklist propagates, uh, you have that problem. That is probably not a problem for a, a lot of these deployments. But when you're operating at our scale, that is a problem that we have run into. 
And if you have good solutions to that problem, I'd love to hear about them. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yeah, please. Yeah, let's see. Sender constraint tokens. Sender constraint tokens, yes. Yes. Um, so sender constraint tokens um, the, is very useful in um, helping you recover if there is a breach, right? So, so, so let's say this attack successfully completes. The attacker now has that token. They have it on a device. Uh, if it's sender constraint, they cannot move that token off the device. And so uh, some of these attacks are specifically to harvest as many tokens as possible. And then the tokens get sold on the black market, right, in the dark web. And, but now they cannot move them off the device. And so I have to spend a lot of energy to get a token, and I can only use it for myself. Mm, not so interesting, right? So it's, it's a, it is a, a very effective way to remove some of the economic scale of these attacks. So that's, that's why the central constraint is there. Right. Thank cool. you. Uh, I saw we another are, hand there, yes. We're, uh, sorry, let's, let's get to this uh, question. I think we have to wrap up. I was getting some you, signals you're from You're getting signals there. from, yeah. <laughs> well, come up and we'll, we'll, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll yeah, let's, let's address this async. 